And welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Mark Dumlin. I'm a business development manager with MJ Flood Technology. You're welcome to the latest in the series of webinars that we're running. Today's topic is the Internet of Things and Cisco's view of a better connected future. I'm joined today by uh, Tony David, who's a solution architect with Cisco. And I'm also joined with Paul Glynn, the CEO of Davra Networks. So we're going to talk through the concepts uh, associated with the Internet of Things and how they will help drive your business into the future. With that, I'm going to hand over to Tony to, to lead the presentation. Uh, I would ask you to, to please hold questions until uh, the session is over this afternoon. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Mark. Um, Tony Lovett here. Hopefully everybody can hear me and see the slides. Um, my name is, uh, as Mark said, my name is Tony Lovett. I'm a technical solution architect working for Cisco. Uh, I'm just going to basically uh, take you through the next 15 minutes on um, the Internet of Things. Um, but before I do, I just want to make sure that we're all sort of singing from the same hymn page um, in terms of there's a number of uh, different terms being bandied about the industry. Um, the Internet of Everything, the Internet of Things, uh, the mach and machine to machines. So I just want to clarify a exactly what we're actually going to talk about and what these different terms are. So if we use sort of the analogy of the, the, the Russian model, the, the Internet of Everything um, is essentially a Cisco term. Uh, um, and it's about people, it's about process, it's about data, and things as well. And it's about all these different things basically interacting with each other. And as I say, it is basically a Cisco term. The Internet of Things basically is a, first of all, it's an industry term, and it's basically around how we connect things themselves, whether that be a door, a car, a plane, a train, a meter of some sort, or some sort of sensor. Um, and it's all based on IP communication, so it doesn't really necessarily involve people, should we say. Um, inside that, then, we also have what we call machine to machine. Now, this has been around for a while at this stage, and really came from probably the service provider market or the mobile operators. And the idea here was maybe putting a SIM card into a vending machine, for instance, and when maintenance was needed on the vending machine, it would talk back to a, a another machine um, using a communications MTC, which is actually uh, written by the standards body, which is 3GPP. So all their communications and standards are basically governed by that body uh, within the whole sort of machine-to-machine -machine market. And I suppose the distinction between machine to machine and the Internet of Things is it's not necessarily based on IP communications as well. So just to sort of talk about sort of, you know, the, the, the Internet of Things and the Internet of Everything and, and, and what we mean by sort of connecting different things onto this, sort of onto the Internet. If you actually look at what is actually connected today, um, there's about over 70% of humans are actually not even connected to the Internet. So there's a vast body of people that are still have no connection to the actual internet today or any network. But if you actually look at the amount of things that are actually connected to the internet um, or any network, you know, 99% of these things are not connected. So first of all, there's a big opportunity here of connecting all these different things or the smart objects to a network and also people connected to it. And I suppose that's really where Cisco are coming at it from a point of view of the term the internet of everything. So moving on then to sort of where the rubber hits the road, as I say, the Internet of Things. And we'll, I'll talk about that now over the next few minutes. But just before I do, I just really want to talk about sort of the evolution of the Internet itself um, and how it's going to facilitate, basically, uh, bringing all these things onto it. If we look at sort of the evolution of the Internet, it's gone from being purely a sort of a, connect, a connectivity, a large network, basically, that connected people, basically, on the actual network. And that was kind of when it first came about. It then kind of evolved into sort of the network economy where we could buy stuff online and people did business online. And then, you know, in the last number of years, obviously, it's been evolving into sort of the uh, immersive experience, maybe some people would, would call it, in terms of, you know, social networking, being able to transmit video over the internet, and that immersive experience. And now it's moving then to encompass everything, basically, that people that process that data and those things. So using sort of the analogy here of, you know, roadways or paths, if you like, you know, the, the internet has started to evolve from just, you know, getting from point A to point B. Um, based upon sort of a, a lower architecture and the analogy, sort of dirty paths basically, and traffic would go where it was on an as needed basis. And there wasn't many really rules or maintenance required around that for it to work. You know, infrastructure now, um, you know, we want to get from point A to point Z and all points in between, if you like. 
And what we've done then to solve the sort of the, the blossoming of cars as the analogy, but devices and people on the network, we doubled the lanes, we tripled the lanes, we went to four lanes, and we even had sort of pool sharing lanes or priority lanes, if you like, to make sure this uh, everybody got to where they needed to go. And we could hard ha handle large volumes of traffic, but it also does suffer from you know congestion at times as well. So we need some form of rules and maintenance for it to, to run smoothly. However, in the sort of tomorrow's infrastructure where you know potentially you go into sort of uh, more advanced uh, um, transportation methods and as the analogy goes and using the air, now we really need uh, hard and fastened rules to manage all this traffic um, you know in the air or on the internet um, as I say. So, so just then to sort of set the definition of what I mean by the internet of things. It's a pervasive and ubiquitous network which enables monitoring and control of the physical environment by collecting and processing and analyzing data generated by smart objects. And, and that's really sort of the key point. It's basically putting intelligence into objects and then giving them a voice to communicate about the physical environment, about things that they see. To enable that to happen, we, we need some standards, basically. So there's lots of protocols, and I'm not, I'm not going to go through those protocols today, such as Ripple and Configi and other standards. And there's lots and lots of standards out there at the moment in this particular area. But IP is, is what brings all those things together, basically. And that's one of the key aspects of the Internet of Things. It is all based on IP. So the Internet of Things is really the emerging IT platform, bringing together computing, storage, networking. And really it's made up of sort of, you know, first of all, the, the infrastructural core, if you like, the actual fundamental core of the actual network, data centers. And then around that then we have, you know, the, the mobile access. So the network is becoming more pervasive as wireless communications uh, floods the entire world, if you like. And then on top of that then we have our sensor, sensory swarm, the, the tags, the sensors, the embedded systems, more laptops, more mobile devices. So just a couple of more terms just to talk about that you'll come across when you're sort of looking at the Internet of Things as well. You know, most people are familiar with sort of the cloud or cloud computing, where we have the intelligence somewhere in a data center, if you like, and we call that the cloud. Another term, though, that, that's, that's sort of becoming more and more used is the fog. Um, and one way to think about this is sort of maybe distributed c computing, if you like, that there's this, an element of intelligence in devices that are connected to the network. And they will do some pre-analysis before sending on their information, if you like. So there's, there's pockets, if you like, of, of compute connected into this network. And it's able to do some analysis before actually sending on the data, rather than just sending all the data back to the actual core of the actual network to the cloud. And then obviously we have the endpoints. This is you know, made up of all these sensors and so on. And all that put together, basically, is this pervasive computing that we have. So just going back on standards, you know, it'll just sort of a, a, a slightly humorous slide, but sort of makes the point of what's happening. You know, the situation is we may have something at like 14 competing IoT standards. Um, 14 ridiculous, we need to develop one universal IoT standard that covers everybody's case, and that works out perfect. Now we've got 15 competing IoT standards. And a lot of times that's what happens with standards. But, you know, if you look back to, say, 2007, give or take, there was lots and lots of standards like Z-Wave, ZigBee, XMesh, et cetera, et cetera. And what we really need is sort of a single, clear architecture, open standards, and interoperability uh, between all these voices. And that's the key point, which is what that IP is the enabler to bring all that together. So the IoT, the Internet of Things drivers, if you like, that's making this all possible is the ubiquitous computing, that intelligence of things at the in the edge, um, in that fog, as I mentioned, and also in the cloud. It's that ubiquitous use of IP as the communications uh, mechanism between different devices and the convergence of these proprietary protocols, if you like, and not having to depend on protocol gateways and, um, you know, and that which then limits the communications between these different devices. And it's also about the ubiquitous connectivity that you know, more and more uh, devices have the capability to be able to connect into networks using low speed networks, wireless networks, or even fixed networks as well. So it's those three things together are enabling the Internet of Things. The, the architectural philosophy behind the Internet of Things is really being able to move from the interaction between uh, capable devices but via proprietary or closed systems that we've had today to sort of that distributed intelligence and actions across standardized networks and standardized interfaces. 
and that's really what that diagram on the right hand side is trying to show where we'll have you know small networks doing an element of compute i.e. the fog but then the ability to send that information further into other networks and to share that information between one network and one device and um, other devices on the actual networks as, as well. So I just want to just sort of talk for a few more minutes just around sort of the scope of applications of what potentially this can bring and really it has a very very broad scope and um, as you can see here on this slide there's lots of things from predictive maintenance to defense applications, healthcare, smart homes, security, safety, intelligent buildings, um, smart grids, smart cities. There's lots and lots of different applications where, where, where this, is, this is going to be useful. And that's actually, it will probably I mean, in some impact have, uh, on all, all our lives going forward. So just talk about it, some of those examples. So like a smart city, for instance, you know, we can have um, disaster prevention and management around you know, uh, faster communication when a fire breaks out or if floods are coming or avalanches, for instance, uh, depending on where you live, obviously, um, you know, in terms of you know, controlling the water supply as well and the quality of that water supply and, get, again, getting faster information about that, about vehicle status. You know, as you move around, um, you know, maybe sort of in somewhere like yeah, mainland Europe, uh, whereby you will be changing from one country to another country, you know, the car can all automatically update its settings, for instance, within it. Also, maybe to be able to get telematics about road conditions, where if an accident happens, you know, just literally, you know, a kilometer up the road, whereby the car would automatically get notified about that accident, for instance. Obviously, applications within the home in terms of appliance control or security as well, or even actual um, accidents and notification of emergency services, for instance. So there's lots and lots of applications within um, smart cities as well for the Internet of Things. Even then, breaking that further down to even just sort of a, a single building, maybe, um, but maybe multiple industries, you know, and in every single building, you're going to have things like lighting, HVAC, metering, um, access control, security, etc. you know, water, all these different systems. And today, they're typically based on sort of different proprietary systems. And what we, we know what, what we're, the way this is moving now is it's all moving to IP communications. And then that gives us the ability for all these systems within a building to be able to talk to one another. So now you can have your access control being able to talk to the lighting systems, the HVAC systems, and, and even the IT systems even within buildings. So that now when somebody walks into a building, the building is aware of who has come in and can start activating systems maybe as an example within the actual building itself. Um, it has huge applications uh, around sort of the, the grid or the energy supply, um, right from sort of the users right through to the actual um, transportation of that energy, right through to the actual generation um, of energy as well. Being able to look at both residential and business and be able to maybe do some monitoring control of consumption, and being able to also even look at where residential people may be actually able to feed into the grid and to be able to monitor that and supply back into the grid as well. Being able to look you know, from a, a government perspective about renewable sources and being able to utilize those renewable sources more, reducing em emissions as well. And then from the, on the utility side, being able to manage that demand more efficiently, be able to have the integration of those renewable energies and, and compliance cases as well. So there's lots and lots of uses around you know, um, the smart grid as we talk about the, the advanced metering systems as well um, for monitoring the actual usage and supply uh, of energy on these networks. And, um, you know, if you look at, say, even uh, another example would be actually even just within a vehicle itself. And if you look at a vehicle today, there's actually lots of connectivity in today's vehicles um, in terms of, you know, collision radars, for instance, monitoring the sensors of uh, wheels for tire pressure, um, uh, GPS, internal Wi-Fi networks. But typically, they're all separate networks, all operating proprietary. And then generally maybe some sort of protocol converter maybe within the car bringing some of those systems together. But they're very disparate separate networks. So really what we want to get to using the IoT is a single network for you know, home use, enterprise use, uh, OEM, roadside, the, the connecting into the smart grid, but all these different networks connected together basically um, and being able to share that information intelligently uh, for, for, uh, within the, the actual vehicle. 
again, sort of, a, you know, in, in other applications around transportation, um, you know, you can be able to use this for a, a, adaptive cruise control between vehicles. And actually, interestingly, there was a, an article in the paper just uh, literally yesterday I was reading about uh, investigating ways whereby um, police forces will be able to actually automatically disable an engine of a car, basically, that it's actually chasing, rather than having accidents potentially happen um, by actually chasing a car, where now they can actually request that an engine that can actually be disabled. We can have obviously safety systems, notification of accidents, fleet management, passenger information, and, and, and you know navigation as well for that matter around uh, all these different devices together. And in some regard, you know, toll collection as well, and in part we're probably doing some of that today uh, on our own road systems in terms of the actual communication of RFID tags um, and automatic uh, deduction of tolls, for instance. So there's lots and lots of applications around transportation as well. So just in summary then, you know, it, it, in my mind at least in terms of the internet, it's a really exciting uh, development happening around this. It's a really exciting area to be involved in. Uh, it is going to have major impact on not just humans but society as well and environmental as well. Um, it, you know, what's enabling this is the use of IP to bring together that convergence of all these different domains based on all open standards and hopefully IP being able to solve this challenge of bringing all these different sensors together and offering basically a better world for us all, more information that actually then we can actually make use of intelligently. So with that, um, that's the end of my, my few minutes of presentation. I'm going to hand you over to uh, Paul, uh, who will take you through his slides. So bear with me just while I hand over uh, to Paul. Paul, you should have access there. I'm assuming you can or someone would have told me. Okay, thanks for that, Tony. Um, as Tony said, my name is Paul Glynn. I'm CEO here at Davra Networks. Uh, we're an Irish company based in Dublin. Um, we develop a, a, a platform that allows system integrators like MJ Flood to deliver managed services around this whole area of the Internet of Things. Um, we're also a Cisco development partner, okay, so we work quite closely with Cisco all around the world on some of just the type of projects that Tony has been touching on there. Uh, in fact, I'm, I'm actually I'm just flown in this morning from New York where I was with Cisco and the New Jersey Transit Authority who are looking to connect 3,500 train carriages. So uh, some really interesting projects going on. I'm also completely jet lagged and sleep deprived, but I'll try and keep it together for the next, next few minutes. Um, uh, what the Internet of Things is. I think it, it possibly makes some sense to talk about what it isn't just before we start. So it's moving away and the market is moving away from traditional IT uh, environments like data center and campus and branch type networks. They're, they're, they're growing but they're not growing as well as they would have at one point. Uh, but what you're seeing massive growth in is in this area of excuse me, operational technology. So where organizations are looking to connect devices they've never connected or connect assets they've never connected before like buses trucks, trains, ATMs, vending machines, uh, oil and gas pipelines, even healthcare. So you're seeing a huge move towards these newly connected devices. There's 99% of devices that Tony mentioned there that aren't yet connected are starting to come online. And it's mainly been driven by, by growth in cellular technology. So, so 4G is, is, is really pushing that one. We would also work with customers who connect over radio and, and satellite, but the vast majority of cases are cellular connected these days. Um, and key differences, or these IoT networks are two, two key areas where they're different to the traditional network environments. One is scale, which I think is, is sort of logical that there tends to be a lot of these devices. If you take Coca-Cola, for example, they have about four sites in Ireland, so they have a four-site WAN. If they were to look to connect all of their vending machines, which they're certainly doing in other countries and we're working with them in other countries to do, that would bring probably another four or 5,000 sites into their WAN. So scale is obviously uh, one of the key areas, the key differences between traditional networks and, and, uh, and IoT. But probably the more fundamental one and the one that brings the most issues with it is traffic type. Because where traditional networks are very application focused, um, IoT networks are much more data driven because there's no people involved. So you're not worrying about email or browsing or, 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 or SAP or other applications you're focusing on just mass, you're generating massive amounts of traffic. Okay, and, and, and that brings with it a 
lot of issues and areas, particularly around the area of management, that we wouldn't be used to. Um, so what I'm going to focus on for my next next 10 minutes or so is just some of the areas that we found from our experience that people need to be aware of when they're starting to roll out these IoT implementations. And, and uh, to do that, I'm going to start with a, with a very non-technological customer that we work with. Uh, this is a, a customer of ours who uh, operate in an industry that's thousands of years old. And although it's seen its fair share of technological change over those years, its fundamental business practices really have been set. This particular customer is a farmer. Okay? So, and as a farmer, he has two key business goals. One is early in the season, he wants to uh, sow his seed in the most efficient manner possible in order to maximize yield. And then late in the season, he wants to harvest the crops and get them to market for the best possible return, best possible price. So not exactly a, an obvious use case for IoT here, but this particular farmer is a bit unusual. They've got 30 million acres of farmland around the globe, and they're doing so with a fleet of over 50,000 tractors. So this is, this is farming on an industrial scale. Like these guys are very, very good at what they do, but they believe they can be better. And what they're looking to do is that they believe that by digitizing their farms, digitizing and, and making proper use of the massive amount of data that that will actually generate, that they will be able to get a, a chunk in a dish farming organization, say, is available to farmers that implement proper, what they call precision farming techniques. So this is IoT in the farming environment, and there's, there's a huge uh, potential return for any organizations to do it right. So the, the, the first thing, I suppose, when you start looking at IoT in, in any environment, this, 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 uh, this environment in particular, first thing you've got to understand is these guys are certainly not specialists in next generation networks. So in order for us and for, for ourselves and Cisco to deliver uh, an effective and, and, and successful um, IoT uh, implementation here, we have to take away any complexity that's not directly related to their core business. So we have to hide everything to do with the sensors and the, the data collection and the data delivery. And we have to give them, we have to take the raw created from their farms and deliver it as usable information to them. And we do that through use of what's called an open API. Okay, so I, I would assume most of the people on the call are, are, are relatively technical. So programming. Now, this is as technical as my presentation gets, but this is sort of important because what, it, what, what an API allows us to do, it's like a shortcut for software developers. It's a way of a software developer getting access to information without understanding where that, that information came from, how it was collected, or how it was delivered to them. Okay, uh, an interesting analogy I heard once, it's like phone a friend and who wants to be a millionaire. You want piece of information, you want an answer to a question, you don't know the answer yourself, so you make a call and you are given the answer. Okay? And what that allows our farming guy to do is focus just on what's relevant to him and build applications or feed data into data analytics tools. And this particular customer just spent half a billion dollars to acquire a data analytics company because they want to own every element of the data that's created. So by us delivering this raw data to them in a format they can use, we take away a massive amount of complexity from their projects. Um, example of where it's work uh, uh, before, I'm just back from Barcelona where the IoT World Forum was held about three weeks ago. And the city of Barcelona collect massive amounts of information from traffic lights, street signs, road sensors, even video cameras. And they've, uh, they deliver that information in an open API to absolutely anyone who wants to use it um, and to design community or city focused applications. So what that gives them is a massive return on the investment they're making by getting free developed. So they've all sorts of applications being developed by citizens of Barcelona based on the fact that they have easy access to this information. Okay? Now the more observant of you may know that that's actually O'Connell Street. It's a very clean picture of O'Connell Street with no junkies and no litter but uh, it's uh, it's not Barcelona. It just looks it's a pretty it's a pretty picture of Alcantara Street. But uh, it's a, in order to successfully deliver an I a large scale IoT project, it is important to understand the value of using an open API and working with partners like Cisco and like MJ Flood, who can take away a lot of that back end complexity 
and just deliver information to you in a format you can use for your business. Right. My second is the value of local intelligence. Again, Tony touched on this a little bit earlier. Um, the real common misconception in the world of IoT that all these devices at the end here, they're all dumb and that all the intelligence is in the cloud. And, and that's just not the case. Certainly, you have it and deliver it straight to the cloud because it's important. That's, that, that, that's a given in every IoT implementation. But the thing is, you will always have different types of data. Okay? So some data is exact time. So sensor data, that's just a bit status. Okay? We work on projects where we would have sensors sending a status update every five seconds. Like that's a lot of data to be transmitting back to the cloud, storing, analyzing, presenting. That all costs money. So using that local intelligence, that fog computing that Tony touched on earlier, we can just look at that make and make a decision, okay, that's fine, everything is working, I don't need to transmit that data. And that will massively reduce the overhead on your, uh, on your, on your, on your back end systems. Okay, so our farmer friend is collecting sensor data from, from uh, soil samples on it that he collects from the tractor. Some soil information is only relevant if the temperature drops below a certain level. So if it's a sunny day, if the temperature is high, it's not relevant. So again, we need to make a local decision to dump that data. Okay? Oh, sensor, the way lines. And they've, they've uh, Cisco IP cameras on the railway lines looking for anything falling onto the lines. If something falls onto the line, an alert is generated and a video feed is sent back to a central data center, or sorry, an operation center, where someone will look at the video feed and decide is it snow, is it, is it, is it leaves, is it, is it twigs, or is it rubble, or is it a car parked on the line. Now, that's fine, that's critical, it needs to be sent back. But if we get that alert at the same time that we get a trigger from another sensor which tells us a train has just come through a signal box 500 meters down the line, we don't have time to send it back to the, the operation center. We need to make a decision locally. Again, getting back to Tony's point about local intelligence, this is where vendors like Cisco really come into their own. These guys have, they have that local intelligence, they have the onboard ability to make those decisions and, and change traffic lights or change signal strings to get that train off that line immediately. Okay, so that, that's, that's the sort of step checking into the cloud from a monetary perspective and also from just, just a reality. Some data just need to be, needs to be reacted to immediately. So all shape the value of working with a vendor that gives you that local intelligence. And as I say, our view, we work with a lot of vendors, is Cisco are really the only game in town if you need that type of, of that level of local intelligence. Third takeaway, I suppose, the key one is, is scalability. Now, that may sound obvious. You, you, you heard Tony earlier mention about, I think he, he said something about 50 billion devices connected to the internet by 2020. So you would assume that everybody will think, oh, I need to make sure the systems I put in place are completely scalable. down and really think through your implementations, you will, and we see this all the time, people underestimate how much data they will actually generate. So, uh, an IoT uh, project with maybe a thousand devices, each of those devices transmitting information back every five seconds, that's 20 times a minute, it's about 20,000 transactions a minute, okay? So you may decide, okay, we, we want to give ourselves the ability to scale, we want to allow ourselves to grow to double that or maybe five times that. We'll give ourselves the ability to scale to 200,000 transactions a second. Well, to be enough, okay, our database scales to 4 million transactions a second. It spikes means that we can very of a billion transactions a minute, and even that's not enough. Our customers are telling us they need more. So we're working with people like VCE and their VBlock architecture to get that to a billion transactions a minute. Now, I'm not suggesting that anyone here will generate a billion transactions a minute, but people uh, how much traffic they generate, and it all comes back to that local intelligence story. So if you imagine devices, and all of those devices are talking back to the cloud, but they may need to talk to each other. They may need to share data and share information amongst each other. So at that 
can't potentially want to talk to another thousand devices, or certainly another 999 devices, 20 times a minute. That's 20 million connections, or a potential possible 20 million connections every 60 seconds. So even in relatively small IoT environments, the amount of data that can be generated is absolutely huge. And you, you do need to take that into account very, very early. And you deal with that by giving yourself scalability at the back end, but you also deal with that by utilizing local intelligence properly to only transmit what is relevant. Okay, and these are based on working in a lot of projects in a lot of places around the world. So open and AP intelligence and the importance of scalability. There are three takeaways I'd like to, 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 to give you today. Um, obviously, there are, there are a number of people on the call who come from government uh, backgrounds. I would love to say, please make all your data openly available. You have a huge, uh, huge resource there with your, your citizens. Um, from a business perspective, uh, again, the value of the local intelligence and scalability is key. If there are any farmers on the call, seemingly there's, there's about $20 billion in extra money out there. There's a chunk of it with your name on it if you can do this right. So um, I think I have to hand back to Mark now. Mark, if you can unmute yourself, and I think I have to give you the ball. You got it? Okay, thank you, Paul. Um, apologies there for some of the sound quality uh, issues. We know we, we had some issues as the, the slides were transitioning. Um, there's a question in from the floor, I think based on the, the, the um, the quality issue we had there just a second ago is probably better if Tony answers it. Um, but apart from the, the the farming example we've had there from from Paul, is there any other examples of of deployments locally of the Internet of Things? Is that Tony, is that something that you could take up? Yeah, sure. Um, there's there's been I suppose one area that we're doing a lot of work with at the moment is um, an energy supply company um, looking at um, using lots of metering, uh, advanced intelligent meterings, basically to communicate obviously supply, sorry, de demand and supply uh, usage of uh, energy. Um, but but it's not just that. That's one aspect of what we're doing there around sort of smart grids. Uh, we're also uh, uh, working with that company in terms of looking at um, how to uh, increase safety within um, substations for information. So again, bringing back uh, information like video and so on, access control um, systems, as well as actually um, sort of SCADA type information in those locations. Um, and again, communicating all that type of information over an IP network back to uh, sense of control. So therefore now they can actually not just monitor usage of, of uh, energy, but actually monitor the substations. Um, and then obviously then the, the next stage of that is then actually monitoring the actual transportation of that in terms of the actual grid itself. Um, and then obviously uh, into uh, supply. So that, that, that's one uh, very uh, pertinent area that we're, that we're working on uh, today. And Mark, Mark uh, I don't know whether you are having voice problems from my side, so I'm not sure what you can and can't hear, but um, there, there are certainly a lot of early stage projects at the moment around the transportation space, so people connecting buses in particular. There, there are some Dublin bus guys due to be on the call, and uh, I know they went to tender recently for the connected bus, um, and there's, there's a number of smaller fleets around Ireland looking to connect vehicles. There's a lot you can do in that environment as well, and GPS tracking is, is a key part for that. Okay, thanks guys. Um, are there any other questions from the floor at this stage? Okay, I don't see any questions coming in. So I'd like to thank you for your time today. Thanks for attending. We, we hope you found the webinar to be useful. Um, if you do have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact us. And uh, also keep an eye on the MJ Flood Technology website for future webinars. We are running a series of these at the moment. So thanks again, and good luck. Thank you.